Welcome to day three. Uh, what an exciting conference it's been so far. Thanks so much for joining us here this morning. My name is Christine Primer, and I'm the Smart Cities Program Manager at Georgia Power. And I have the unique pleasure of being joined today by, uh, by several folks that I hand-selected to talk about a topic that I'm particularly passionate about. Um, so today, I'm joined by Dave Kirkpatrick, my former colleague and mentor and friend from SJF Ventures, an impact investing fund in Durham, North Carolina. Evan Pittman, Vice President at Energy Impact Partners, a fund that Southern Company is invested in, and Daly Irvin from Engage Ventures, a, a venture capital fund that Georgia Power is invested in. A couple of years ago, Dave loaned me a book, as he did often, and it was the biography of Elon Musk. Some of you may know him. And there was a quote in that book that stuck with me, and it was from a, a former Facebook employee and he was leaving Facebook, and he cited the reason as uh, being that there's the brightest minds of our time are getting a pe are figuring out how people can click Facebook ads. And this stuck with me in particular because I believe the brightest minds of our time should be working on the hardest challenges our society faces. And the reason I'm so excited about the panelists here today is they're supporting entrepreneurs to do just that in two really important ways. One, supporting entrepreneurial ecosystems to build economic development and develop a pipeline of talent that can work on the, the most critical city challenges. And two, using the new technologies and business models that have transformed every other industry to help support uh, city challenges like mobility, sustainability, and public safety. So with that, I'll turn it over to the panelists just to do a quick introduction of you and your firm, and then we can dive into some questions. Start with you, Dave. Sure. Thanks, Christine. Uh, well, it's great to be here, and uh, it's, it's exciting to see this sort of smart city theme. I think at, at SJF Ventures, our byline is high growth, positive impact. As Christine mentioned, it's really using capital to drive ventures that are solving social and environmental problems in a way that also generates great financial returns. And we haven't always thought about a city perspective on what we do, but I think we focus on, on sort of the physical infrastructure, so energy, and clean electrification and solar. One of our companies developed the first big 100 megawatt solar project here in Georgia down in Taylor County. And electrification of mobility for sure, sustainable food systems, and then a circular economy in terms of uh, sort of reverse logistics for materials. And then on the, on the sort of human and social capital side, we have companies that work a lot with sort of the future of work and education, mobility, and uh, like trying to get to more of an inclusive economy for everyone in society. Um, and also in health, actually, when we look at our health portfolio, most of our companies are digital, getting, getting health and wellness into the home and preventative and out of, out of sort of a hospital and clinical setting. So I guess I can think of all, all of those in terms of helping make a more vibrant sort of city as well, uh, although we haven't always framed it that way. Specifically in terms of our tools, our latest fund's 125 million. We tend to invest at a growth stage, so usually we're trying to help companies build from one, two, three, four million in revenue to you know, hundreds of millions in revenue. And that phase of growth is called Series A or B, kind of growth capital across the country and, and eager to engage more in this conversation. Thank you. All right, um, Evan Pittman with Energy Impact Partners. We are actually uh, investing in similar stage companies. So we're um, uh, providing growth capital, um, like Dave said, for companies looking to grow from you know, a few customers to being at scale in the industry. What's unique about Energy Impact Partners vis-a-vis uh, -vis other venture capital firms is that about 80% of our capital comes from electric utilities. Um, so Southern Company was one of the first utilities um, to come into the fund, and after that it grew to a coalition of about 14 global investor-owned utilities. Um, and we're really a strategy tool for those utilities, um, basically helping them see around corners, figure out what are the technology trends and business model trends that matter, um, where, they, where might they face disruption. So we, we are out there scouting these technologies um, for the utilities, helping them learn more about them. And then the team that I run at uh, EIP in particular is called Innovation and Commercialization. And we are about actually taking the technologies that we've identified as very promising and figure out how to scale those in the industry. So deploy those out with our utilities, deploy those into cities, um, and drive success essentially for both sides of our coalition. The companies we've invested in uh, are utilities from a strategic perspective and, of course, generate financial returns for them as our investors as well. 
That's EIP in a nutshell. Great, thanks. And uh, Engage Ventures, we're a corporate venture platform for Atlanta's 10 largest companies. So this is the Delta's, UPS's, uh, Home Depot. Uh, we'd like to say we're kind of the nursery for their early ideas. So we invest um, usually seed or early Series A, and we help kind of grow them to scale. We get their first enterprise customers, and uh, we've done about 37 investments now. And uh, the companies have, have we, we've only been around for, for two years, but uh, I think the corporate partners that, that, that use us, it's, it's for that connection to one, to each other, and uh, two, to kind of the early stage kind of entrepreneurial community. So we want to bring it, uh, innovation to the southeast as opposed to, to going elsewhere to, to find it. And uh, the collection of these big Fortune 500 companies here is usually the big draw for these guys. Great, thanks. So we're going to kick things off. Um, it seems like every time I, I open up the next uh, uh, venture blog, it's talking about creating the Silicon Valley of X, um, whether that's the Southeast, the Midwest, uh, the Southwest. What is it about Silicon Valley that makes it the envy of many communities looking to build entrepreneur ecosystems? What are some of the things that you would want to mimic and some of the things that, some of the lessons learned? And maybe Daly, you can start that off and talk a little bit about ATDC as, as building the ecosystem here in Atlanta. So ha having done startups in, in San Francisco and New York and London and Shanghai, the, the, these big tech ecosystems, uh, one, they've been around for, for, for a while, but there's this overlap between research, big companies, and startups. And once I first moved to Atlanta, what I realized is we actually had these three buckets already here, but they weren't talking to each other. So when the CEOs came together, so Ed Bash and the CEO of Delta, Marty Flanagan, the CEO of Invesco, uh, David Abney, the CEO of UPS, when they came together with George, uh, I mean, Bud Peterson from Georgia Tech, they wanted to put Engage at kind of the center of that ecosystem so that they can have that connectivity to each other. And the thing about Silicon Valley, you can't really replicate it. They've been doing it for 30, 30 years. Um, so we, we definitely don't want to be Silicon Valley, but there's things that we can, we can learn from them. And it's that connectivity. It's that Venn diagram that's completely overlapped. And we're just kind of, I guess, an inning one and two in Atlanta by, by pulling those two together. Great. Dave, you want to talk about some of the, the focus SJF has had on investing in communities that outside kind of the traditional Silicon Valley and, and New York? Sure, sir. When we started SJF, it was originally very much focused on urban and rural settings where venture capital was not going. And as we've evolved, we do now have an office in San Francisco and Seattle and New York as well. But we have prioritized uh, companies and opportunities that are to some extent underserved or in, in, in also just opportunistically are in markets where talent is more available. We, we work together um, when, when Christine was at SJF in a company called Translog, which is a mobility platform for public transit, helping them to be as responsive as Uber and Lyft to deploy microtransit. And really, uh, Ford, Ford Smart Mobility, acquired the company and has built it from 50 to 150 employees in downtown, in, in Durham and the Research Triangle Park area partly because the talent is available there and, and, and folks stay with companies longer than the sort of transients you see with the competitive nature of Silicon Valley. So I think there is incredible opportunity uh, to drive those innovation hubs uh, outside of the sort of overheated market of Silicon Valley at this point. Great, thanks. Um, to jump into what, what it is that these companies are doing a little bit more heavily, uh, Evan, maybe you can talk about some of the companies that uh, EIP has invested in that, that really are focused on some of the critical city, city challenges that you've seen. Sure. I, you know, I'd say, it, it, well, every year we survey our utility partners about what, what are the top strategic priorities for them and consistently working with their local communities to make them smarter, better places to live uh, tops that list. I think, you know, there's opportunities for new revenue there, but even more importantly, there's opportunities to build a community that people want to live in that ultimately leads to more demand for their, their product and, and uh, a happier outcome. So um, we've been pretty, you know, fairly active in the space, especially if you define um, smart cities fairly broadly. Um, you know, sort of most closely uh, or most closely tied to what you'd think of as like the sensing, you know, analytics-based um, smart city. We've invested in a um, company called SimCon that essentially is kind of looking at leveraging the assets that cities and utilities in some cases have out there 
i.e. their streetlights, being able to transform those streetlights into a digital canopy uh, for the city with edge processing power there, uh, actual power for sensors and devices, and then a unified communications platform that can bring all that together um, and generate real insight um, that matters for the community. So we're excited about that. I think you know we've seen most early use cases that cities um, have been interested in pursuing and utilities have had success partnering on uh, with those cities are probably in public safety and traffic management. So seen a lot of coupling that platform with um, shot spotter type technologies and um, uh, uh, traffic management tech. So it of course gets broader than that. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the future, especially from a utility point of view around a smart city is an electrified city. Um, so we're very, very interested in the likely soon to explode uh, electric transit sector um, have looked in particular, we think an early beachhead for vehicle electrification will be uh, around fleets in general, because the higher your utilization, um, the, the more the economics suggest transitioning away from internal combustion. But in particular, um, bus fleets, because there's a concentrated, there's a, there's a high visibility factor there, um, there's a community improvement factor there because you pollute yet less, especially in the parts of the community where the buses you know, route heavily. Um, and so uh, have invested in some companies that are, or one company in particular, that's uh, a tool to help cities figure out how to navigate uh, that transition to electric buses. You would think just swap out the vehicle and run as normal, but it turns out there's all kinds of planning issues that come with swapping out to electric battery capacity changes uh, based on weather conditions. It's highly sensitive to driver behavior, so, so cities and cities need a tool essentially to figure out how to operate these fleets and, and operate them efficiently. So. Those are a couple of examples, I'll, I'll stop there. Great, I'll, uh, I'll let some of the other panelists comment on some of the, the challenges that these companies are, face are solving. Yeah, I mean, we one other, and I'll mention that kind of a segues um, from that example from, from Evan is really, we just didn't, we led a, a series A in a company called Waycare out of Tel Aviv in LA, and it really is taking data from all of the existing city DOT and emergency responder data sources, so 911 calls, the CCTV, traffic monitoring, and pairing that with all the in-vehicle data that's being generated, so the, the, from Google Waze and all of, all of that. So we've seen this explosion in mobility investment. We see some companies out here, right, with that across the ecosystem. And I think a lot of governments and folks that are managing the roads and bridges and infrastructure are like, okay, all this technology is coming out is how do we manage it? And so WeCare really is pulling all that together in a platform with some AI machine intelligence to say, hey, you're likely to have a huge traffic jam here. Accidents are likely to occur here. And in the Las Vegas market, as an example, they're showing emergency response times for several minutes quicker to accidents and, and stopping those sub, sub, subsequent accidents. So I think providing tools to cities and regions to integrate both internally, because really the Nevada Highway Patrol, and all, they weren't all talking to each other to start with, and then bringing in that private data to be more intelligent about managing towards the future and solving problems today, as well as future infrastructure needs. That's another example. Absolutely. Sometimes just having a tool to, to communicate internally amongst different departments is, is just as challenging as, as understanding the outside world. And we've certainly seen that in some of our work uh, at Georgia Power with, with various cities across the state. So you can get that. Um, it's hard for, for many companies to, to sell to cities, let alone a venture-backed type of company. Uh, so what are some of the, the, the most salient pain points that the communities are seeing such that, uh, such that a venture-backed company can, can really tackle those, those pain points? Yeah, I mean, I think I think one one area is really one area for innovative early stage companies is how to engage with cities, and I think that one uh, taking Transloc's example was really how do you provide a tool like Architect is an example that allows the cities to do their job better with something something simple like integrating with Google Maps, and then allows allows for further innovation to be built on it. So kind of data and analytical platforms that are useful to, for scaling. Um, but we have another company called Seamless Docs that sells to cities. And it is, 
it is a challenge and how do you how do you drive that innovation how does it integrate with your existing IT and infrastructure and just simple things like RFPs and purchase systems and how how can you make it a little more efficient for the entrepreneurial company and the city to engage efficiently it's it's not simple for sure so sure and yeah go ahead Daley. Um, one thing that that we've seen as well is that typically these these big Fortune 500 companies too they're they're, they're quickly to uh, to ingest some of these technologies that will later finance finance cities. So we we have a robotics investment that can basically uh, retrofit kind of tugging uh, and uh, like material moving uh, pieces. So UPS, uh, for instance, the way we got it to Delta is UPS has its own uh, airport in Louisville, Louisville, Kentucky. So we can test it on a closed loop course there before we get it to Delta. If we can do it at Delta, then we can do it at the city. So we use kind of the big corporations as our Trojan horse into cities. I think that's a great, great example. Go ahead. Yeah, j just to piggyback on, on Daly's perspective, um, uh, relationships are critically important to make these these sales. And so uh, the, the large entities, the utilities, the other corporates uh, in cities have those close relationships. And so to the extent that um, utilities can work, or I'm sorry, the startups can work with them as partners to get trusted introductions. We've seen that help a lot. We've also seen that it helps to have some non-municipal uh, customers in your business plan if your technology lends itself to that. If you can sell the CNI co co commercial and industrial customers in parallel, that, that kind of gives you some runway to, to crack that um, utility sales cycle. Or, I'm sorry, I'm always talking about selling to utilities, not cities. The city sales cycle. There's some similarities. <laughs> there are, there, especially on the, around the are fast only second heart. <laughs> yes, we, <laughs> Daly and I were just speaking about how our, you know, our, our corporate LPs uh, all are really eager to do technology to, to deploy new technology. But the first thing they ask you for is show me a case study of it working for another entity that's similar to me. Um, and so the challenge is cracking, getting that first case study, and and how do you, how do you find someone who's willing to go out on a limb and be a first mover? Yeah, no, that's an interesting point, and maybe we can dive into that a little bit. And Daly, where, what are you seeing as some of the best ways to get a large corporate player to grab onto, or, or any customer to grab onto something that's so so new um, and maybe yet unproven, but has a lot of promise? Um, I, I think what, what's interesting about, about Engage is so all of these CEOs sit on our board, and they nominated uh, what we call our quarterback, which is now our kind of our Sherpa through their organization. So. Uh, you know, it's Gil West, the CEO of Delta, it's sometimes the chief strategy officer. So those are the teams that I work with kind of on a daily basis. So as opposed to thinking that as VCs, we know everything and we can just find something and then find a customer, we take it the opposite approach where I'm meeting with their strategy and innovation teams. We're figuring out kind of where they're going on their strategic roadmap, kind of their digital transformation efforts, the horizon one, two, and three. And that's our shopping list to go out and find. So as opposed to hoping that they have a customer, we're finding startups that already have a customer ready made. And the other thing that we've realized now that you know all of our, our, our LPs uh, here in Atlanta, none of them are competitive. But what we realize is they have 80% of the same needs. They have the same data needs. They have the same IO, uh, IoT needs. So if it's relevant to Delta, it's relevant to UPS, it's relevant to Chick-fil-A. And you know, we'd like to have kind of one or two, two companies kind of in consensus with that idea. So when we're investing in a company, they already know that, that something's going to be ready for them to try and pilot. Uh, it's much harder if we have the conviction around a startup and we're trying to force it in if they don't want it and it's not one of their kind of pillars or, or remits for the year. Uh, so we like to have a, a little bit of consensus first. Yeah, so all of you have, thank you for that, all of you have a unique challenge in that not only are you being measured on your financial returns, but you're kind of measuring yourself on the success of your impact. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you measure impact both in the, the civic innovation space and job creation, uh, but also how you measure impact in terms of, you know, environmental impact and those types of things. And I know, you know, Dave and SJF has done a lot of work on that over the years, so maybe you can kick that off. Sure. So we we do cross cutting sort of impact across our portfolios. So that includes obviously the thousands of jobs that our companies have helped to create, the carbon impact we do in a carbon assessment uh, across our portfolio each year. But I think where what we're getting more excited about now is that the investment thesis of the company, the figuring out we call it impact alpha, but basically how the the positive impact they're providing in terms of electrification or mobility, social mobility through education, how that is very much tied to business success. Um, 
and then sort of charting that as we serve on the boards of these companies so that we're not just looking at their, their EBITDA and their revenue, but also at these impact metrics. Uh, and the other thing we've been working on is this, kind of this theme we've been calling kind of sort of bending the curve. But if we were to get a kind of a 5x impact, 5x financial return, how do we get 5x uh, financial return and 10x impact? Are there ways we can drive more services to the low-income communities, that, the micro scholarships for high school to college, for example, in one, one example? So, so I think there is, there's the, the, the impact investing world can get a little bit too bureaucratic with reporting on impact metrics, and I think sort of tying it very much to business success uh, in, in an integral way with each company is what's most exciting to us. So. Great. Daly, maybe you could talk about uh, what ATDC has done. It's really transformed a lot of the, the community in Midtown there, and that ecosystem has, has really done a lot. And so I'd love to hear your take on that since you're, you're part of that ecosystem. Yeah, so ATDC is one of the oldest accelerators in the country. They've been around for 30 years. Over 2,000 companies have gone through the halls and graduated uh, out of there. So when a company enters there, they typically have a little bit of revenue, and when they graduate, they have a million dollars in revenue. So 2,000 companies have come in and out of there um, in, the, in the past 30 years. And then kind of where we're, and we share an office with, the, with those guys, and where we're situated in, in the market is we have 42 innovation centers, which we call Tech Square. Um, from companies from all over the world that want to have access to Georgia Tech and want to have access to, to a lot of the startups. So ATDC is, um, if it wasn't for ATDC, we wouldn't have Tech Square, and if it wasn't for Tech Square, we wouldn't have innovation uh, in, in a lot of ways here in Atlanta. So um, you have, uh, yeah, I think it's you have 43 innovation centers within like a two mile radius. Uh, so we're constantly colliding with one, the best research, but also some of the best technologists and some of the best students coming out of, uh, out of Georgia Tech. Yeah, I personally can speak from experience. I went to tech before ATDC existed and kind of watched it blossom and grow. And it's been a real exciting uh, endeavor to just see how now the Midtown community is just thriving with a variety of different companies, whether whether they're startups or more mature companies. It's, it's really been a, a neat thing. Um, Evan, do you want to talk about maybe some of the, the outcomes that some of your companies have driven, whether it's uh, efficiencies in certain, uh, in certain communities or, um, or sustainability metrics? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I, I mean, from a, I'm trying to think from a city perspective in particular. Um, I, I think that probably, I, I don't want to rehash the same example. The best example is probably bus fleet um, electrification in the cities. Um, you know, from a broader perspective, though, we're investing in a, in a wide portfolio of technologies that help our utilities deploy cleaner energy products, um, particularly local energy uh, as well. So um, companies like uh, uh, Advanced Microgrid, solutions that, that Southern Company is working with um, to basically look, get, sit down with their customers around the city, figure out what their needs are, what their resiliency needs are, what their clean energy goals are, and then to engineer the microgrid that can, that can sort of meet those um, requirements best and then to operate it and to, to make it actually financially sustainable by being able to sell the services of that microgrid back to the broader electricity grid and sell clean energy locally to their neighbors. So um, they're deployed in, you know, across, uh, at least in, in California, about um, 200 megawatts of storage, which is a substantial, you know, been, been sort of a substantial piece of this initial movement towards a uh, storage uh, reliant grid. So I don't have like an overall headline metric from that work, but um, very interesting and lots of potential there. Great, thank you. Now we'll open it up to the audience for questions. We have a few minutes, so uh, I think we have a couple mics in the audience if, if anyone has any questions. No? If you do, we can't tell because it's so bright lights. <laughs> we, we can't even see if you're raising your hand, so you're gonna have to light. shout. Fan, someone's fanning themselves. That's okay. Right. <laughs> um, well, we could maybe continue to, to chat a little bit more about. Um, I'd love to hear from from you, Dave, about a couple of the the environmental impacts that have been seen from some of your from your companies as well. Sure. I you know I think that in terms of say the energy transformation, I think what's been exciting to see is. We've invested in solar over the last 18 years, and we have done the most in really large-scale solar. So 
one of our portfolio companies, Community Energy, I mentioned, developed the first 100 megawatt project here in Taylor County. And I just spoke to the developer, and there are four more projects just around the town of Butler there. And we're seeing the cost of solar not only be clearly cheaper than, than solar, I mean cheaper than coal, but now natural gas. Now, now the combination of solar plus large-scale storage, initially in the southwest, but I think it'll be coming to the southeast, we're seeing with bifacial solar panels, with solar tracking, a company called Next Tracker, which we, which we grew and sold to Flextronics, uh, and large-scale, low-cost storage, we're seeing the beginnings of dispatchable long-term uh, and, and wind, the, the ability to move towards a fully clean grid. So I think that's one of the transformations that we're, we're really excited about. And it includes community solar, includes residential solar, includes grid, includes resiliency. But that, combined with electrification of fleets, begins to, I mean, we haven't talked a lot about climate change, but it really begins to show us a path for cities to really embark as a critical sources of carbon pollution for that clean energy transformation. So that's, that's one area that, that I focus on a lot and ties mobility, energy, society together in a, in a very positive way, and the utilities play a critical role here, so. As you look out into the future, um, I think that's always what's kind of fun about working with entrepreneurs and, and, and in the venture space um, is you get a peek into the future. What do you see as some of the biggest uh, opportunities that we have ahead of us, both, both you know, challenges and opportunities as we look to, uh, to really scale companies that can help solve uh, cities' criti critical challenges? So 10% of our bets are, are what we call frontier technology, and this is the crazy stuff that no one thinks would work. This is the stuff that Jetson's promised us and it hasn't, hasn't fulfilled. Uh, two of our investments are kind of fall in that category. One is called Skyrise out of LA. We were promised flying cars. We haven't got flying cars yet. These guys are actually pioneering autonomous drone flight for humans across LA. So if you, I'll, I'll give you a, a code when you're in LA, as opposed to uh, driving for two hours, uh, you can take a, a 10 minute flight across, uh, across the city for the same price as an Uber black car. Um, that's one that- That's live today. That's live today. It's, wow. it's manned flight now, so they can get up their hours, but um, you know- Same it, price as an Uber drive. As an Uber black car. Wow. Um, and that's, so that's going to be, they want to deploy it all over cities. They're right now in their go-to-market framework. That's, uh, and the other one is, is when we look at the building technology, this is a big kind of um, uh, carbon producer. So uh, our investment into Icon 3D, which is the first concrete 3D printing house. Uh, they're the first ones to get a building permit in the world. Um, so as opposed to two by fours that have been around for 100 years, you can actually print the walls of a house uh, within 24 hours using kind of a, a specialized concrete mix. So we look at the, the built world, we, think, we, we look at all these different ways that, uh, again, it's really far out there, um, but we know that it, it's top of mind and you know, cars and also the building, building industry is a uh, giant polluter. So what are we gonna do? We have to invest in it and then we have to partner with, with big industry to kind of help support those companies grow. Great, and that might be also a way to help with affordable housing issues and uh, be able to create a house at a, at a much lower cost. Oh, I think we have a question. Yeah, I don't know if you can see me with the light coming from behind me, but uh, oh, okay. you. Uh, you were talking about uh, electrifying fleets. Have you looked into electrifying uh, light mobility uh, transit options? Electrifying light mobility transit options? Yes. Question. Like scooters and, is that what you mean? Uh, electric bikes that are hitting the market, electric scooters, maybe even golf carts for getting around. So some places in Atlanta here, it's easier to get around via golf cart than it is by car or you know, it's easy to get around, obviously by scooter, by a lot of options, but we're seeing a lot more electric bikes hitting the road these days, so. Yeah, um, I, I mean, we, we, we see a lot of potential in that market for growth. We haven't looked too closely at it. I suppose we tend to think first about what are the biggest loads where there's opportunity to electrify, sort of the biggest sources of demand growth for our partners. And so the scooters and the micro mobility hasn't been quite as big a source perhaps of new demand. Um, so I haven't dug too deep in the sector. I don't know if you guys have any. Yeah, it's an interesting one because uh, the, the, I mean, I can comment a little bit uh, as a, as an investor, it, it's an opportunity for solving a challenge, right? A, a first mile, last mile challenge. Um, but there's obviously a lot of a lot of safety concerns, et cetera, and it's a it's a pretty capitally intensive business. You know, they they have to invest in the the scooters themselves, and um, and you know, 
keeping track of them is, is can be a bit of a challenge. So I don't know that we we have any of, of these folks have invested in them, but they're certainly up and coming, and everyone, including cities, are trying to figure out how to deal with them. Any other final questions? All right, well, with that, I think we can wrap up. Thank you so much for, for you guys for joining us here today. Um, look forward to seeing the future of what entrepreneurs can do to help solve crit critical city challenges. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Kristen. Thank you.